It's been a desperate time for me ever since the war started. Always the underdog, always fighting with destruction just around the corner. But I'm sick at heart of the mistakes, the lost opportunities. General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur was one of the really spectacular characters that I've ever met. And what an actor he was. Either he was idolized or hated, but mostly hated. I am tired of dealing with a lot of prima donnas. You tell that bunch if they can't get together and stop quarreling like children, I will tell them to get someone else to run this damn war. General Dwight D. Eisenhower. At that time and forever after, Eisenhower was the quintessential American. Some kind of grace, I don't know where, where that comes from, but Dwight Eisenhower was the kind of guy you went to and the kind of guy you relied on. No one can conceive the terrible burden that lies on me. Everything is at stake in this war. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. I always knew that my father was a hero. He was really angry when an officer sent his soldiers to death for nothing. My God, I actually pity those poor bastards we're going up against. My God, I do. We're going to murder those lousy Hun bastards by the bushel. George S. Patton. That's the only operative factor in times of war. You are not sitting back admiring your opponents. Not on your life. What you're trying to do is kill him. That's what you're trying to do. He's very handsome. A Greek god. And if we didn't think so, we were told so. But Daddy said, you have to be larger than life for people to notice you. And the men notice me because I'm larger than life. Tonight, in the second of a series of extraordinary television events, Hear the voices of Academy Award winner Anthony Hopkins, James Garner, Mel Gibson, Charlton Heston, Matthew Broderick, Robert Mitchum, Christopher Plummer, and Rod Steiger as they remember the Year of the Generals. And now, please join our hosts, Charles Kuralt and General H. Norman Schwarzkopf. General, good to see you again. Good to see you again, Charles. We are here at your alma mater, West Point, to think about three graduates of this place who emerged in 1942 to help save humanity. I, I don't think that's putting it too strongly. No, I think you're exactly right. They were extraordinary men, but they were three men who could not have been more different. First graduating in 1903, you have Douglas MacArthur, number one man in his class academically, number one man in his class in discipline, the first captain of the Corps of Cadets. And his mother came with him, Charles, when he entered West Point and stayed in a hotel right over there. She came to be absolutely sure that her son was well taken care of, that he studied properly, and probably most importantly, that he didn't get involved with the wrong type of woman while he was here at West Point. Then in 1909, you have an entirely different character, George Patton. Bragging, swaggering, certainly not number one in his class academically. As a matter of fact, it took George Patton five years to get through West Point. And while he was here, he was better known for his exploits on the polo fields and with Sabre than he ever was in the classroom. And then lastly, in 1915, a poor Kansas farm boy, a fellow named Dwight David Eisenhower, graduated in the middle of his class, played football, hurt his knee, didn't even get to finish the football season here. Certainly when he graduated, there was no aura of destiny about him. You've done a little traveling lately in the footsteps of these men, huh? Yes, I've been to London, where Eisenhower came in 1942. I've been to the California desert, where Patton trained tank forces. And I've been to Pearl Harbor. Now, when you and I were last together, we left Pearl Harbor in flames after the Japanese sneak attack. And MacArthur was in the Philippines. Everyone said the Philippines would be the next place to fall to the Japanese. And it was. And so we begin our story 9,000 miles away from here in Manila. It is a story of young men at war and the older men who led them. A story of courage and compassion and the end of innocence. Hello, fellas. This is some V-Dis for you cats overseas. Get groovy and latch on to some of this jive. Dear Mother, I know that you want to hear from us boys more. Just don't worry about us. We're okay. 
If we weren't, you'd be the first to hear about it. I guess you know that this is the hot spot of the East. And I don't only mean the weather. The whole world is a powder keg about ready to explode. I sure would like to be home for Christmas, but I know I can't. I don't suppose it'll be so good this time. Don't feel bad, Mom. There are other mother's sons here, and they're scattered all over the world. So don't worry about me. After all, we are here for a purpose, you know. Well, tell the boys I'd still like to hear from them. And answer soon. Your loving son, Roland. All of a sudden, the alert sounded. As I went out the door, everybody was looking up. And uh, one fella says, it was a lieutenant standing there. He says, my God, ain't that a beautiful flight of naval aircraft? And old Tom went right by him. He says, Lieutenant, you're full of sh He says, them's nips. They caught our planes on the ground because the men were in the mess hall eating. And as they ran toward their planes, they were strafed and killed them. Seven hours after they struck Pearl Harbor, they struck us. A lot of civilians, a lot of troops were killed. They demolished our Air Force completely. The only one that you could blame for that would be MacArthur. MacArthur could have immediately sent his planes against the Japanese. He could have, but he didn't. The fog of war is never thicker than in those very early moments. He was asleep, and he was awakened with the news that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. His Air Force commander had B-17 bombers and fighters out on an airfield and wanted to retaliate. He was told by MacArthur's chief of staff that he couldn't make the attack until he got orders from MacArthur, and they never came. I think MacArthur was more or less paralyzed. MacArthur went on active duty in July of 41 and began proclaiming that the Philippines could be defended. And he had been insisting all along that the Japanese would not attack the Philippines. No, he had it from good sources, he said, and he knew the Oriental mind, and he knew they weren't going to attack. Had a fabulous reputation, everybody, like a movie star. <laughs> uh, very haughty man. He wasn't a soldier's general or a soldier's officer, let's put it that way. More people hated him than liked him. They considered him arrogant. They considered him an egotist. They considered him a headline grabber. Uh, they felt that, that a great deal of the MacArthur myth was one that had very carefully been constructed by MacArthur himself. MacArthur really had almost no plans for fighting a war at that time. And he had led Washington to believe that he was in much better shape to fight a war than, than he was. On December 22, 1941, Douglas MacArthur's worst nightmare came true. 43,000 Japanese troops landed north of Manila. MacArthur's Filipino soldiers dropped their rifles and fled. There was nothing for the proud general to do but abandon Manila and order a retreat. They start moving all the troops to Bataan on the retreat, all except our squadron, the 28 material, stay there. Then on Christmas Eve, I heard music. I walked out on the porch, and there these men were sitting on these duffel bags, singing Silent Night. And I walked back, and I lay down on my bunk, and. I did nothing but think of back home. <laughs> and of all those men, 209 men were in the squadron. After the war was over, 39 came back. This American retreat was stubborn, slow, and courageous. MacArthur directed his American and Filipino troops and thousands of refugees through the jungles and mountains to the Bataan Peninsula, he set up his headquarters on the small fortified island of Corregidor. When they sent us into Bataan, 
they did one thing. They got all the troops in Bataan, but they forgot to bring the food, the medicine, and the supplies. We had no food available, and we were sick, and they had promised us help. Help was on the way. Where's Uncle Sammy? Where's the help coming? And then we had a, a slogan out there. We are the battling bastards of Bataan. No mama, no papa, no Uncle Sam. No aunts, no uncles, no, no nephews, no nieces, no guns, no planes or artillery pieces, and nobody gives a damn. For 77 days in a tunnel on Corregidor, Douglas MacArthur awaited the reinforcements and supplies that never came. Probably out of embarrassment, he visited his army on Bataan only once. The troops on Bataan resented MacArthur's neglecting them. They say, there he is, dug out dug in his foxhole on Corregidor. It was utterly unjust uh, because of his anything that MacArthur was not lacking. It was uh, physical courage. Some of it was very foolhardy. He would. Uh, the Japanese would begin bombing Corregidor, the bombs dropping all around. Well, instead of seeking cover, he would stand outside uh, just to defy them, uh, show them, as he often said, that the, the bullet that will kill MacArthur has not been cast. If there was a bombardment, everybody who had gone out to get the sun would come in pretty fast into the tunnel. But they would meet MacArthur going out. I think literally every evening for three weeks. As we were eating dinner, we would first hear this brrrr, and then brrrr, as a Japanese plane was dive bombing on us. And MacArthur would go on talking as long as it didn't get too loud. And then you'd hear the bomb go off, and we would sit there and eat. I remember I lit a cigarette to see if I could light a cigarette, and I found out I wasn't shaking. But one of our generals, <clears throat> who had false uppers, would start looking like this. Then his tongue would come out, and his upper plate on his tongue. Well, that helped us a hell of a lot. And then as the bomb went off, it would all go back in. But uh, we were supposed to continue talking. MacArthur fought a battle of tremendous heroism on Bataan and Corregidor. He knew he wasn't going to win. He was trying to hold up the Japanese as long as possible, and by golly, he did. And uh, how much worse it would have been in that moment of uh, great national questioning in the United States in f January and February 1942 had Corregidor and Bataan gone the same way as everywhere else in the Pacific. We had figured out many, many years before Pearl Harbor that the Philippines could not be held indefinitely. MacArthur was too important a person to be allowed to fall prisoner to the Japanese. It was clear that this would be one of the great victories for the Japanese that they could take him. And the whole question that uh, raged here in Washington was whether or not MacArthur would obey an order to, to leave. President Franklin D. Roosevelt emphatically wanted MacArthur out of the Philippines. The job of ordering him out fell to the one general who was indisputably MacArthur's superior, a quiet, confident, unsung American hero of World War II. We'll tell you his story next. It just so happened, General, that when war broke out, the number one soldier, the chief of staff of the Army, wasn't a West Pointer at all. That's right. George Catlett Marshall graduated from Virginia Military Institute in 1901, had to wait in line for his commission until 1902. Yet in 1942, he was the general that emerged probably with the most awesome responsibilities of all of them on his shoulders.
There was a great division among the staff as to whether this non-West Point chief of staff man was, was the one to do the job because he was not known. He was promoted by Mr. Roosevelt over 50 or 60 general officers when he made him chief of staff. But those people who had served with him and knew him uh, had no question about it. You may not I've known who he was when he drove up in his car in front of the munitions building and got out and walked in, but there wasn't any question about what he was. He had sandy hair and a whole lot of it. Very thick blonde hair and very sharp blue eyes, very blue. And he was not handsome, although I thought he was. He enjoyed children. He loved children. And that's what I was, a substitute child, because he had no children. In any case, we got along very well together. He was a very modest man, and his honesty, his honesty was absolutely unshakable. When he got mad, when he was angered, uh, it, his, his silence was withering, and it was glacial. I'm here to tell you, but he, I've heard him say on more than one occasion, I can't afford to be angry. He says it's, uh, <laughs> it's too inefficient. <laughs> they have no time for anything but managing America's war. And Roosevelt didn't disguise the fact that he was wholly dependent, but dependent on Marshall for, for military advice and military direction. He's the only person that I know of that the president didn't call by his first name. He never called him George, to my knowledge. Always the general this and general that. But he had great, the president had great nicknames for everybody, you know, but not, not General Marshall. He didn't want to be liked. He, for example, made a resolution that he would never laugh at any of President Roosevelt's jokes. He did not have a great many close friends. He had a few that he thought world up, but I think he felt that if he was going to be the chief of staff for the army and organize this army and win this war, that he didn't want to have any baggage of friends around him that people supposed had influence and so forth. He would only appoint men who he thought could win the war, and he chose brilliantly. MacArthur was the man George Marshall chose to take charge of the Western Pacific. Even though years earlier, when their roles had been reversed, MacArthur, as chief of staff, had banished young George Marshall to a humble post with the Illinois National Guard. That, some people said at the time, was an act of petty jealousy. It sure was. He was jealous of him. He didn't want him to get ahead. He held him back as much as he could, but, and Colonel Marshall knew it, but he never complained, and he never did the same for MacArthur, because he appointed C MacArthur head of the uh, army in the, in, in the Pacific. He wouldn't do that. That's mean. That's what I mean. He was never did anything petty like that. He was never jealous. The member of Marshall's staff who was advising him on the Philippines at the time was named Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower had spent much of his military career just behind MacArthur. When MacArthur came to the Philippines, he brought his aide de camp, Dwight Eisenhower, with him. There's a great quote by a newspaper man who said, in those days, MacArthur used to, quote, lecture us, but we got the real information from a guy named Eisenhower. There was no love lost between these two, MacArthur on Eisenhower. He was the best clerk I ever had. Eisenhower on MacArthur. I studied drama under him for eight years in the Philippines. Eisenhower thought MacArthur should stay in the Philippines now to live or die with his troops. Bataan is made to order for him. It is in the public eye. It has made him a public hero. It has all the essentials of drama. He is the acknowledged king on the spot. But MacArthur was too important, both as an American commander and as an American symbol. President Roosevelt gave him a direct order to leave Corregidor. And at sunset on March 11th, stretched out seasick in a PT boat, Douglas MacArthur escaped to Australia. I could have held the town if I'd not been so completely deserted. A merciful God's miraculously brought me through so far, but I'm sick at heart of the mistakes, the lost opportunities. I shall return. And when MacArthur left, we felt that we were being deserted. I heard that uh, famous saying, I shall return. We wanted to know why he was leaving. <laughs> when we heard that MacArthur had left Corregidor, we were overjoyed. 
I didn't know why MacArthur had made this decision, but it was impossible in the Japanese army that a general would run away. I remember our chief commander said that since MacArthur had deserted, Batan and Corregidor would fall soon enough, no matter what we did. Good Friday, they attacked. They came down in a couple of hundred thousand strong, and they were fresh battle-tried troops. And these men were well-fed, well-rested. They were all healthy men, and we were starved. We had an awful lot of malaria. We were out of everything. I saw the American flag come down, and that was a very sad moment in my life. But there were worse things to come. A Japanese officer issued an order, and a Japanese soldier went into one group, and there were a lot of Filipinos. And he grabbed a Filipino, and he pulled him out, and he went into another group and grabbed an American and pulled him out, and they took these two men and beheaded them. They wanted to show you who the boss was, and they were very, very convincing. They told us who the boss was. When I saw the American surrender, I had very mixed feelings. They were tough, and they had fought bravely. But they didn't seem ashamed of themselves for being captured. What followed their capture was one of the cruelest episodes of World War II. The starving captives were forced to walk 65 miles to prison camps in a brutal trek that became known as the Bataan Death March. 10,300 people died in that 65 miles. I actually saw a Japanese shoot a little girl because she threw candy and uh, he bayoneted her and shot her. And then when he came back to where we were, he took his handkerchief and was wiping the blood off of his bayonet and he's laughing, thinking it was funny. And the, all the Americans just turned their back on him and kept on marching. If you fell to the wayside and you couldn't make it, you were either bayoneted or they shot you right there and left you there. And gradually as we walked along, the road became more and more full of bodies, left there bloated and fly infested. Some gave up and just died because they wanted to die. You can will yourself to die when you become so discouraged, and uh, many men did that too. I stayed with one fellow from the Buffalo, New York area all the way through, and he was very sick. But he tried to help me early on, and then he died a few minutes after we arrived in uh, O'Donnell Prison Camp. But I, he, he died with, with his head in my lap. He was, he was a very good friend of mine. The heroes are buried there. I am a survivor. The heroes are dead and buried there. Everyone was your friend. They were all Americans, but you're trying to survive. Not to be fresh now, but you could have laid Betty Grable down naked and put a bowl of rice next to her, and she had been trampled to death getting at the rice. Now this, I'm only bringing a picture out what starvation does to an individual. We're going to open with Betty Grable and her bombardiers and marching to a love song. You all know who Betty Grable is. That's Hollywood's answer to the fuel shortage. And here she is, Betty Grable. You'll be marching there beside me. Back home, Americans were trying to keep their spirits up with war bond drives and patriotic spectacles. People knew things were bad in the Philippines, but they didn't know how bad. We were losing 40 Americans a day. There were no individual graves. There was one, one grave, or at most two, to take care of the dead for one day. I was put into death row. Death row was a section of, that the Navy corpsman had set up for men that weren't expected to live. 
And they'd come in and they, this one's gone, that one's gone. And they'd take it out for the burial detail. And one morning they come in and they, this one's gone. They'd, no, not yet. <laughs> the rumors of what we lived on, it, there were rumors that said, oh boy, when this is over, you're going to get all sorts of things, even a free Ford. <laughs> they told us where to get a Ford. And another time they told us we get a lifetime pass to something. You know, <laughs> we never got one day. <laughs> For one brave month after the fall of Bataan, Corregidor held out. The last month on Corregidor after Bataan fell, the Japanese set up their guns along the uh, Bataan Peninsula, and they shelled us day and night, and they bombed us in the daytime from the air. And that tunnel sometimes would shake, sometimes lights went out, and we had worked by flashlight, shrapnel from the bombs would fall near the patients, and they just lay there, unafraid. They've been shelling us faster than you can count, and we may not be able to stand it. I am really low down. No rest, short rations, tired. Corregidor used to be a nice place, but it's haunted now. We are waiting for God only knows what. We expected a landing of the uh, Japanese. There was a full moon and we thought, a lot of men said, well, they'll probably land uh, by the light of the moon. I feel sick to my stomach. They are around us now. Everyone is bawling like a baby. They're piling dead and wounded in our tunnel. I know now how a mouse feels, caught in a trap, waiting for guys to come along and finish it. On May 6th, Corregidor fell. If those men hadn't held out that long, it would have been a different story at the beginning of the war. The American people certainly owe a debt of gratitude to the people who fought in the Philippines. With MacArthur gone, General Jonathan Wainwright was left in command. It was he who suffered the indignity of surrender and the agony of the death march into captivity. It's an image that's been left in people's minds that MacArthur, in fact, abandoned Wainwright. But the truth of the matter was the decision was made in Washington that MacArthur was too important to be sacrificed, even though so many others were. There he is. There's the hero of Bataan. Strong, dynamic, vigorous. It is true that MacArthur is but one human being. It is equally true that he alone cannot win this Pacific War. But just the same, his appointment as Supreme Commander-in-Chief is mighty bad news in Japan. He was a hero of such proportions as you can't imagine happening in the United States. He hadn't done anything to, to be made a hero of, but he was all we had at the time. MacArthur has come. He has seen. He has conquered. And MacArthur never admitted it, of course. When he got off the train at Melbourne, he surveyed his new domain as though he had been allotted it by a king, and he made a speech before Parliament uh, that had these Australian politicians weeping. The Bataan force went out as it would have wished, fighting to the end of its flickering, forlorn hope. No army has ever done so much with so little, and nothing became it more than its last hour of trial and agony. He was a great orator. Some said a great ham actor, but I thought he was a great orator. When he felt that he was being neglected, he had to plead to the public for more, more forces to be allotted to him. He felt that next to the Japanese, are, he had to be most aware of what the Navy was trying to pull on him. And I was amazed how much time he spent worrying about that because I thought when you're fighting a war, you're worrying all about what's in front of you. Here's a high jumping tune dedicated to the kind of action we want to see you enjoy mighty soon. While MacArthur fretted that the Navy might get the headlines in the Pacific, a Navy lieutenant wrote a letter home from a South Seas island. Dear Dad and Mother, received your letter today and was glad to hear that everyone was well. Things are still about the same here. 
have a lot of natives around and I'm getting a hold of grass skirts, etc. I was interested in what you said about MacArthur's popularity. Here he has none, is in fact very, very unpopular. His nickname is Dugout Doug. No one out here has the slightest interest in politics. They just want to get home morning, noon and night. As far as the length of the war, I don't see how it can stop in less than three years, but I'm sure we can lick them eventually. My love to everyone, Jack. Jack, the Navy lieutenant, was John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Well, this famous uh, overlook of the Hudson River from West Point must have been a place pretty well known to MacArthur during his cadet days here. I'm sure it was, but in 1942, he was a long way from here. MacArthur found himself on the sidelines in Australia while the limelight in the Pacific shifted to an admiral named Chester Nimitz. Nimitz was a different sort of fellow than MacArthur, wasn't he? I don't think you could have found a man whose style was more unlike MacArthur's. He was known as being quiet and relaxed, but he was also known to be a great admirer of efficiency and aggressiveness. And it was Nimitz who masterminded the greatest victory in the history of the Navy a victory that 50 years ago today turned the tide in the Pacific. The Admiral looked like a Southern gentleman. The most remarkable thing about him was his eyes. The blue eyes would sometimes look like they were sending thunderbolts at you. Otherwise, they would be very calm and sunny. And that's the way you told what kind was going on up here. MacArthur never let the Admiral forget that he had promised to return to the Philippines. The Admiral described MacArthur as having a magnetic personality, but he said MacArthur often poses and he pontificates too often. MacArthur was able to convince most of the public that he was in command out there, you know, which was not true at all. Even during the Carl Sea battle in uh, May of 1942, although it was fought in MacArthur's area, it was fought entirely with Navy ships, almost entirely. MacArthur contributed a few bombers, which only bombed our own troops, our own ships. Um, but he insisted on issuing communiques about the battle, even though he didn't really know what was going on, except what he got off the Navy radio. The Japanese, seeking a knockout blow in the Pacific, telegraphed their intention of a massive assault on a location codenamed AF. They were confident. They had every reason to be. The Japanese had been winning victories all over the Pacific against anyone they fought. No one was able to take them on. They had won victory after victory after victory everywhere they had fought. So they were convinced that they were invincible. My name is Iozo Fujita. I was a fighter pilot on the carrier Soryu. Everyone felt so proud, as if we had already conquered the whole world. We had done so well, we didn't bother to keep this operation secret. It wasn't like the attack on Pearl Harbor. Everyone was relaxed. We played cards. Mostly, we drank. <laughs> they had some 187 capital warships that were coming out to the Pacific against us, and we could look around and count, and we had 26. They had eight aircraft carriers. We had two. They had battleships. We didn't have any. All of ours are in the mud at Pearl Harbor. They had over 47 destroyers, for goodness sake, and we've only got 26 ships total. So it didn't look good. Outnumbered that badly, Admiral Nimitz decided his only hope was to set a trap for the Japanese fleet. He sought the answer to a big question. Where is AF? His cryptologist sent a message intended to be overheard. Midway Island running out of water. 
Back came a communique from the Japanese command to its navy. AF is low on water. That's all Nimitz needed to know. AF was midway. Nimitz was reading their mail and he clearly understood what it was they were going to do, even though most of the intelligent folks in Washington didn't agree with him. He believed the intelligence rather than ignoring it, and therefore he was ready when the time came. North of the Pacific Atoll called Midway Island, 50 years ago this very day, June 4th, 1942, the little American fleet lay in ambush awaiting the 165 ships of the Imperial Navy. Nimitz ordered U.S. planes launched from their carriers. It was a roll of the dice, do or die. I had just ordered some rice bowls for breakfast when I heard that enemy planes were coming. I took off and found four enemy formations. Each had five planes, like stairs. I decided to attack from above, from in front. So when I dived, they were all in a row. I hit the plane every time. We eventually shot down all of them. On the way in, my squadron is annihilated. I saw, I think, nearly every airplane in my squadron get shot down. They were blowing up, going over on their back and hitting in the water. It was a mess. I was the only one that got in close enough to drop a torpedo. When I returned to my ship, no one on the bridge knew anything about the torpedoes that had been running in the water toward our carrier Soryu. They'd been watching the dogfights, cheering and clapping their hands. They weren't watching out for anything. I thought it was disgusting. I remember looking up at the target, the Kaga, and I remember thinking, my God, that's a big mother. I went clear through the Jap Navy, got in there close enough to drop a torpedo, and went out on the other side, and the Zeros came around and shot me down out there. The airplane sank, and I went down a little bit, came up choking, and here comes the whole damn Jap Navy. Now I'm going to get run over. But they made a big wide turn and came back and stopped right where I was. As I always say, I don't know what's so magnetic about me, but they came right back to me and stopped and sat there and burned, blew up all day long, and their cruisers and destroyers are going around picking up their people. And that's the one thing that had me worried. I didn't want, I didn't speak Japanese, and I didn't want to have to learn. It's not easy to dig a foxhole in the ocean, <laughs> but I was sure trying. Of 30 pilots in his torpedo squadron, George Gay was the only survivor. Floating in a life jacket in the Pacific Ocean, right in the middle of the Japanese Navy, he watched wave after wave of American planes come in and be shot down as he had been. Then he saw the last two squadrons of dive bombers arrive, the last American hopes riding with them. Those were the planes that sank three Japanese aircraft carriers in five minutes and reversed the course of the war in the Pacific. I was shot down on the 4th, picked up on the 5th, and flown to Pearl Harbor on the 6th. Admiral Nimitz came to the hospital to see me, brought his whole staff with him, scared the hell out of me. I'm the first man from our Navy to get back to our Admiral to tell him about the largest, most decisive naval battle in history, and I've sat there and saw the whole damn thing. Our carriers, Akagi, Kaga, and Soryu, had been sunk. All ships filled with soldiers who were to land on Midway were lost. Maybe God thought we were so arrogant that we deserved to be punished. There's some amazing parallels between that and Pearl Harbor. Remember Pearl Harbor. The Japanese made detailed preparations. They flew detailed rehearsals. The Americans, on the other hand, felt, oh, these Japanese are nothing. We can defeat them easily. They were lackadaisical in their maintenance programs. They were lackadaisical in their security. What happened in Midway? A complete reversal. Midway didn't feel like a victory to the sailors aboard the carriers, counting the planes that returned crippled or that failed to return at all. Thank you.
But grievous as the American casualties were that day, Japanese casualties were ten times greater. Before the Battle of Midway, there were no major American victories in the Pacific. After the battle, there were no major defeats. You know, um, a realist looking at Europe at this time of year in 1942 would have said there didn't seem to be much hope for humanity ever being free again. Hitler had overrun the whole continent and his divisions were attacking Russia. The Russians were fighting what looked like a losing battle to save their country. Yeah, and the British were in full retreat and about to be kicked out of North Africa by a German general named Rommel. Rommel probably more than any other general in the history of warfare, had an intuitive feel for the battlefield. And that's why he was known as the Desert Fox. Dearest Lou, it's two years today since I arrived on African soil. The battle is raging. What will happen if things go wrong? That is the thought that torments me day and night. Your husband, Erwin. I always knew that my father was a hero and I was very proud of him. And when he was not at home, I took his steel helmet and put it on my head and looked in the mirror but it was not so impressive. My father always pointed out, in order to become a hero, it's very important to survive. But he tried to give a good example, and so uh, people had confidence in him, in critical situations. War is a very human business. I mean, it's an inhuman business in that you're going around killing people, but on the other hand, it's a human business because people are frightened, they're confused, they're worried, they, uh, they, they, and if you have someone on your side who doesn't look frightened, doesn't look confused, it, it restores some of your self-confidence. I think that's why Rommel was so tremendously successful. He had this positive obsession with wanting to feel the battle, so he actually commanded from a tank. He used to drive with the leading tanks and take the spearhead about with him where he felt the weak spots to be. One of his principles was flexibility. He was convinced that in general, when people believed that they were right, they were wrong. And so he had a very self-critical attitude. It was an amazingly extemporaneous way of commanding. Up against the first British that he met, they literally didn't know what had hit them. Germans appeared from directions they didn't believe they could come from. He had so many victories at the start that we thought he was unbeatable. We came up against him quite a few times, and to be perfectly honest, we were on the run. As a matter of fact, there were one or two uh, higher-ups on the road with their guns out, ready to shoot anyone. There was a uh, sort of running away, and eventually Monty came along. And Monty made sure that we didn't do that anymore. He made sure that we went forward and forward and forward. Monty was General Bernard Law Montgomery, notoriously immodest and famously popular. The British commander who arrived in North Africa in 1942 to match himself against Rommel. He was a sort of military monk, as you know, his wife had died before the war. Um, he'd said to a, a close military uh, acquaintance, well, that's it, that's the end of it. He had no personal life after the death of his wife. He was entirely devoted to the army and when it came to the war. Monty came round and he said, you know, you know me, you fought under me all the way through the desert and everything else like that. You know I win battles 
uh, you know you're safe in my hands and we always win when I'm there. And I've come back here and I've had to take a look at the plans, of course they're quite useless, and, and I've revised them all. Uh, uh, and uh, we're, we're going to win this battle and you're going to be with me and I'm proud to have you with me and you, you know, and, and that. Never had any more trouble. Well, he made us feel as though we were ten feet tall for a start off. We thought Monty was marvellous. We still do. Montgomery took weeks to plan his offensive. When he did attack Rommel at the little Egyptian coastal town of El Alamein, it was with 1,200 tanks and 230,000 soldiers. The racket was something awful, it was deafening. The thousands of guns opened up at the same time. And we kept going forward after that. We saw rows and rows and rows of German tanks battered. Lovely feeling, lovely feeling. Dearest Lou, the battle is going very heavily against us. We are simply being crushed by the enemy weight. At night, I lie open-eyed, racking my brains for a way out of this plight for my poor troops. We are facing very difficult days. The dead are lucky. It's all over for them. Your husband. At El Alamein, Montgomery gave the British their first major victory of the war. One of the most interesting points to my mind about the business of making war is the way people try and shake your confidence in what you're doing. If I had done all that was suggested, I would still be back in the Alamein area. It was an absolutely golden rule that you must never disagree with him. He would always make fun of other people. He would never allow anybody to make fun of him. Although he told me, long after the war, he was driving along the road, being driven, uh, along the road and he saw a small boy walking along the road carrying his school books and his knapsack at the back. So he stopped and said to the little boy, would you like a lift? And the boy said yes. So when the boy got in, of course, the first thing Monty said was, do you know who I am? And the little boy said no. So Monty said, well, I'll give you a clue. I'm a field marshal. And the boy looked absolutely blank and said, oh, yes, my father worked, my father's a farmer, he works in the fields too, what do you do? And Monty said, I kill people. Oh, said the little boy, do you really? How many people have you killed? Monty said, thousands. And the little boy said, please may I get out? <laughs> For two long years, Britain had fought alone suffering under 50,000 tons of German bombs. Two million British homes were destroyed, 40,000 British lives lost. In the war rooms, deep under the streets of London, Winston Churchill and his generals planned their defense. Central map room, duty officer speaking. One day in the spring, a man from America came down here to see if he could be of help. May 29, 42. Dwight D. Eisenhower, Major General, United States Army. It's hard to imagine what Eisenhower must have thought when he signed into this book. I mean, just to think of the awesome responsibility that he was carrying on his shoulders. And with all the conflict and the disagreements that were going on, and this, up until then, obscure Major General, United States Army, was sent to London to put it all together. Dear Mamie, even if the worst should happen to me, please don't be too upset. I feel this war is so big, so vast, that my mind completely refuses to visualize anything beyond its possible end. But I do hope that regardless of what may happen to me, you and John can always be proud that we three are one family. Ike. He went to war so suddenly. I got word in June of 42 for West Point. So I applied for leave, and I had no idea what his job was when I applied for the leave. I said, well, what's your job going to be over there? And he says, well, I'm going to be the commanding general. And I was sort of like, well, you're what? Fourteen months earlier, he'd been a lieutenant colonel at Fort Lewis. 
lieutenant colonel. But I remember when he was in England, wrote home, I guess, to my mother, <clears throat> saying, look at here, I've got signed autographed pictures from the president, from General Marshall, and somebody else. And he was sort of pinching himself, look where I am. At that time and forever after, Eisenhower was the quintessential American. Andy Rooney was a cub reporter for the Army newspaper Stars and Stripes. I was assigned to cover his press conferences sometimes at 20 Grosvenor Square. I thought he was a genius, not in the sense of having any great brain, but he had some, uh, he was so even and so normal and regular and so likable. Very early on, Ike established himself as not only an American general, but a real friend. I remember that he was somebody who had a very tough job to corral not only all his own generals, but the British generals all under one roof, and also deal with my father-in-law. I don't imagine any of the British upper echelon uh, military were happy with an with a American commander-in-chief. Uh, it. It really was a situation in which Americans had taken over their war. Their bars were overcrowded with American forces. Their streets were packed with American troops. The phrase, you know, the trouble with the Americans is they're overfed, overpaid, oversexed, and over here. Hardly a one of these young Americans crowding into England had ever seen an hour of battle. As a matter of fact, neither had their commander, General Eisenhower, though he had been in the U.S. Army for more than 30 years. No wonder that there was a little resentment in war-weary London that this unknown, untested American general was about to become Allied Commander-in-Chief. The British had a certain attitude that with your resources and our brains, we'll all do very well. <laughs> and the uh, American attitude was that uh, maybe the British had more experience, but they hadn't been all that successful up to this point in the experience that they'd had. Matter of fact, as the longer Eisenhower was there, the more there was an appreciation for him. The only thing you heard really was, was a questioning, uh, and I couldn't put my finger on this, I couldn't give you a source for it, but a little, little underlay of a question of whether he was too much a political general whether he was there to hold Churchill's hand or whether he was there to plan the invasion of Europe. Eisenhower wasn't pro-British. Eisenhower was pro-getting the job done. And that's the nature of coalition warfare. Trust me, I know. Okay, that's the nature of coalition warfare. You have to, you have to make sure that all parts of that coalition are players and come together in some kind of consensus. And Eisenhower, of course, was a master at it, absolute master at it. I think sometimes that I am a cross between a one-time soldier, a pseudo-statesman, a jack-legged politician, and a crooked diplomat. I walk a soapy tightrope in a rainstorm with a blazing furnace on one side and a pack of ravenous tigers on the other. The plan that Marshall told Eisenhower to put together was a plan for the invasion of the mainland of Europe. And of course, developments then turned out that that wasn't what the British had in mind at all. What the British had in mind was approaching Europe cautiously, the long way around by way of North Africa, where they were already fighting the Germans. Ike was appalled. He argued vigorously that the first Allied strike should be directly into Europe. Churchill went over Ike's head he traveled all the way to America to tell President Roosevelt, it is too soon. We are not strong enough yet. When you looked over at the coast of France, what did you see? 25 combat experienced, highly trained German divisions dug in ready to fight. And the British looked at the American military machine at the time and their own military machine and said, no way, we're just not ready. The Germans are too strong for us to go headlong rushing into a fully prepared defense against that many divisions. So in July, it was finally settled. The Allies would invade immediately, but in North Africa, not in Europe. Eisenhower was disconsolate. July 22nd, 1942 will go down as the blackest day in history. There was a big 
clash, but I think that once the military saw all what Britain was undergoing, they realized that it was not possible to do it quicker. Americans are always in a hurry. Churchill talked them into it, and I think probably it wasn't the right thing to do, but uh, at the time it seemed the right thing to do because it, it got the war going. The Yanks were coming, headed, though they didn't know it yet, for Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. But who was going to lead them into battle? General Marshall reached back into his memory and chose a swaggering old warrior friend of his named George Patton. This is the place. This is a spot in the California desert picked by General George Patton to train American armored forces to take on the Nazi war machine. 162,000 square miles of desolate desert stretching from California across the border into Arizona. When Marshall first resurrected Patton, a lot of people thought he was making a big mistake. And Marshall made the statement, I know how to control George Patton. He's easy to work with. I got to tell you, that startled everyone who heard it because no one felt that they could control George Patton. He was out here at the Desert Training Center and received a phone call to come back to Washington. Didn't know why. He flew into Washington and he met with General Marshall. Marshall then explained to him Operation Torch, told him why they were doing it, told him what he expected of Patton, and told Patton he was going to give him command and then said, now go over to the War College, which is where the planning was going on for Torch. And the staff is going to brief you on what you have available. And that's all you have. We don't have anything else to give you. Patton went over, received the briefing, and then called Marshall back. Couldn't get through to him, but finally got through to the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army and said, pass on to Marshall that I've looked at this thing and it doesn't make any sense at all. I don't have enough troops to do the job. I don't have enough landing craft to do the job, and I need more. The deputy chief of staff went in and told this to Marshall. And Marshall said one thing, order him back to Indio, California, period. And they issued orders and sent Patton back out here. Now, you've got to understand, here is the penultimate war horse who more than anything else wants to go to war has been offered command of Operation Torch and goes into Washington, D.C. and blows it. And Pat came back out here. He spent two days out here. And at the end of those two days, he tried to call Marshall again. And this time he called seven different times and couldn't get through to General Marshall. But he did get through to the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army again. And he said, I've had two days out here to think about this. And as only Patton would put it, as only Pat would put it, he said, I've had two days to think about this, and I have decided that I can probably carry off that stupid plan that your staff has put together with the forces that are available to me. And he said, please pass that on to General Marshall. Deputy Chief of Staff went into General Marshall and told him what Patton had said. And Marshall looked up and said, order him back to the War College. And then as the Chief of Staff was about to leave, Marshall grinned and said, that's how you handle George Patton. I have decided to give command of torch to that SOB nobody wanted, George Patton. He's very handsome, a Greek god. And if we didn't think so, we were told so. He had wonderful self-confidence. I was born in 1915 and I I can remember very well when my old man came back from that war. And I saw these boots. Then this creature kneeled down and had big yellow teeth. And I figured it was an ogre come to eat me up. <laughs> it was daddy. He wanted to be a fireman until he was seven. <laughs> and then he decided to be an army officer. 
because he was a family worshiper. We all were brought up to think our ancestors were perfect. They were Confederate gentlemen fighting for the honor of the Confederacy. These were his roots. So there was no question about the fact that there was a, a, a huge element of romanticism in, in this very, very complicated man. Don't ever forget he was a great historian. He was a great reader of history, of military history. He could give you the Battle of Carthage as if he'd been there. Of course, he thought he had. But he didn't believe in death. He believed in reincarnation. And we were brought up to believe in it. And so none of us are afraid of dying. Well, General Patton was a very flamboyant and, 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 and able officer. He was a cavalryman, and Marshall had known him for a long time because they'd served together several posts. Patton was a great polo player, and boots were quite shiny and flamboyant, very uh, profane, but quite a bright person. And uh, I think he was secretly one of Marshall's favorites because he liked the way he, direct way he did things. General Marshall liked Daddy, but he knew Daddy damn well. And he respected Daddy's ability as a soldier. And I think he deplored the fact that Daddy was a show-off. But Daddy said, you have to be larger than life for people to notice you. And the men notice me because I'm larger than life. One of his theories, he had a lot of theories. He often used to quote from the Bible and from other books, and uh, I think one of his greatest quote was, take no counsel of thy fears. Plus, another quote he had from the French revolutionary Danton, that I think was the basis, because he often quoted, the basis of his strategy. Uh, translated in English, it's audacity, audacity, always audacity. Audacious George Patton was now about to lead American troops ashore in North Africa, the landing all the other American generals still thought was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's very interesting when you see all of this fighting that went on until the ultimate decision was made, July 22nd, to go with Torch, and then once the decision was made, the only person, the only person that was going around saying, yeah, boy, Torch is great, was a fellow named George Patton. And he was all for it. And frankly, I think that one of the reasons why Patton was for it is because so many other people were against it. He just, that was, that was his nature. You will be inspired by magnificent hate. We're going to murder those lousy Hun bastards by the bushel. My God, I actually pity those poor bastards we're going up against. My God, I do. On the morning of November 8th, George Patton and his 34,000 green American soldiers entered landing craft from ships offshore and headed through rough seas for the beaches of Morocco. With them went a 26-year-old wire service reporter, Walter Cronkite. Nobody ever faced a flying bullet before. Uh, didn't really know what to expect. Uh, and obviously there was a concern of anybody going into battle but we didn't have any experience of it. We were really innocents, all of us. Within three short days, Patton's men were innocents no longer. They had won their first battle, and Patton was off chasing the enemy. Commanders will fight much more readily than they will pursue. Now, Dad perceived somehow or other in Patton that this is a man who had pursued like a maniac till everybody was dropping dead. <laughs> He was a general who got more out of green troops than anyone else could conceivably get. New troops encountering General Patton did well because they were more afraid of him in back of them than they were of the enemy in front of them. Patton is pure fiction. Carried those pearl-handled pistols, strode around like an idiot. He was a bad guy. I dislike him intensely because I think he cost a lot of American lives. He was a bad guy and a poor general. But you'd never know that. I don't know why there's something about Patton that just captured the American imagination. And Eisenhower was partially responsible for that.
Eisenhower always treated him like Peck's bad boy. He amused Eisenhower. Well, it was okay for Eisenhower to be amused, but Patton was an egotist who was, who was, would spend troops, and by that I mean get troops killed for, for his own purposes. I had heard uh, some of our people saying, our blood and his guts, uh, but soldiers are authorized to make comments like that. Uh, I still believe deep inside they were happy as the devil to be with General Patton as opposed to somebody else. We were delighted to be in his army and be a part of his success story. Patton was in his element, fighting the enemy at last. There was one enemy he especially wanted to fight. He respected Rommel very highly, studied his military manuals on strategy very carefully, and then said he would like to meet him man to man. Patton would get in the tank, Rommel would get in the tank, they would have a distance, and just like the knights of old, you know, where they have these tournaments, and these two, winner take all. <laughs> Been interesting, huh? At one point, he announced that he was going to go into battle against Rommel, and after defeating his Africa Corps, he was going to personally shoot Rommel on the battlefield. I mean, even went so far as to say that. And he never fought him. Never fought him at all. By the time Patton had linked up with the British and was ready to fight Rommel, the Desert Fox was no longer in the desert. He had been recalled to Germany. In fact, the most intense and hard-fought rivalries of those early days of the war were not with the Germans at all. The rivalries were among the Allies, Patton with Eisenhower, Eisenhower with Montgomery, and Montgomery's hot rivalry with absolutely everybody else. The Clash of the Titans, when we return. You know, what strikes me about these allied generals was the explosive clash of personalities. Uh, it's almost as if they forgot they were supposed to be allies. How do you explain that? Well, first of all, they were all great leaders. They were effective. They won battles. Take Montgomery and Patton, for example. They both won battles, but they both shared one other thing. They were hungry for glory, and they didn't want to share that glory with anyone. They were impatient, they were emotional, and most of all, they despised each other. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> now, here was a man who had the patience and the self-control to be a great leader, Dwight David Eisenhower. And because of that, he was the man that took these battlefield hotheads and molded them into a winning team. Yeah. And it was a full-time job, believe me because Montgomery was always there. Montgomery didn't get along with anybody, least of all American generals. I think, I think Churchill summed it up best when he said, Monty was magnificent in defeat and insufferable in victory. <laughs> Real trouble with the Yanks is that they're completely ignorant as to the rules of the game we are playing with the Germans. You play so much better when you know the rules. The demands upon me that must be met make me a slave rather than a master. Pity the soldiers of history that had to work with allies. Montgomery had rivals everywhere. He would have made a rival out of anybody. He was impatient with superiors and scornful to equals. And he simply adopted that attitude towards Patton, who, given his character, didn't like it at all. Patton's conviction that he was so right also caused him to believe that anybody who disagreed with him was absolutely wrong. I mean, he was never willing to compromise. He couldn't stand coalition warfare. I mean, even, even though Eisenhower was a dear friend of his, on many occasions, he was known to condemn Eisenhower out of hand because he was selling out to the Brits or he had become, he had become an ally rather than American, this sort of thing. Patton, uh in one of his moods said that Deb was the best general that the British had. And he meant it. 
Sometimes I think I will simply resign and not be a further party to the degradation of my country. If I suggest to Ike that this is the case, he will tell me that I don't see the big picture. I wish to God he was an American. In a matter of months, amid endless quarrels, but with superior forces, Patton and Montgomery drove the Germans from the desert. The biggest amphibious assault of the war was coming up, the invasion of Sicily. To lead it, Eisenhower took a deep breath and chose impetuous Patton and methodical Montgomery. Montgomery wanted to sit behind his artillery for quite a long time before committing troops to action. I think Montgomery really had a fear of defeat, uh, probably uh, an ego thing. He'd been successful in the desert, he was a national hero, and he didn't want to commit that ranking to an uncertain result. General Patton, when he had the resources, he wanted them to be used to the best way possible and in the quickest way possible. And Montgomery was a man that took great counsel of his fears and wanted to tidy the battlefield up and everything is set pace before he would launch. And of course, Patton's philosophy was just the other way around. And he openly criticized Montgomery for this. As a matter of fact, at one point, he, he, he accused Montgomery of using the same tactics that he had used in a battle in World War I, in World War II. So, so needless to say, this did not, uh, you know, warm the cockles of Montgomery's heart and did not endear Patton to Montgomery. A few days into the battle for Sicily, George Patton had had enough of Montgomery's caution. Suddenly, he drove his American 7th Army north and west. He took Palermo. He didn't stop. He just kept going, sensing that the defending Italians had had enough. The Italians didn't want to fight. They'd been in war a long, long time. They wanted to get it over with. Service wine and food and whatever. I've been in their homes and ate spaghetti. I don't know whether Montgomery was actually racing with Patton, but that's pretty well established that Patton was racing with Montgomery. It became a matter of honor okay, for Patton to get to Palermo and Messina first, and he did. On August 17, 1943, Patton's army entered the main objective, the port of Messina. When the first British troops showed up, one of Patton's sergeants said, look, here come the tourists. But right at the height of Patton's triumph, a story appeared in the newspapers back home that spoiled it all and almost ended his career on the spot. He slapped an American soldier. He had gone to a hospital to visit the troops. And he came across this one soldier who was sitting on a box. He said, what's wrong with you, soldier? And the soldier said, I, I just can't take it anymore. And Patton said, I had to do something about that. He says, I wasn't going to take that. I can sense General Patton's anger when he saw wounded men lying around in the hospital. And here was a fellow, and he asked him, well, why are you here? Well, I just couldn't take it. Well, you feel like grabbing him up by his throttle and talking to him about that. And that's what Patton did. He was carrying a riding, you know, officers carry this riding crop. He says, and I, I made my points and, you know, touched him on the, he didn't say anything about slapping or anything, that he, he was doing this to him. He says, because I wanted to make it clear to all the soldiers around there, we were not going to tolerate this at all. This was out. This was finished. And I told the, um, uh, doctors nearby to check this man out, see what, see what was really wrong with him and get him back. In November, we began to hear about newspaper reports that General Patton was accused of slapping a soldier in a hospital. <laughs> no, we had never, nobody had heard anything, nobody, I hadn't even, I'd forgotten that particular incident. And then it really broke. It seemed to have gotten all the way to Congress. We were sickened by it. I don't, I don't know what he thought he was doing. Here was a guy who had been under fire, which Patton never was, for an intense period of time. And who knows what happens to a man. This guy, probably less than perfect, fell apart. Couldn't, nerves couldn't take the dan constant danger. He fell apart and was hospitalized. Patton goes in the hospital and slaps him. Got him and kicked down the stairs himself. Pearl-handled pistol and all. 
Eisenhower was given the directive to do something about it. He got in touch with General Patton. He was ordered to apologize to all the troops on the island, to apologize to the soldier, to apologize to the nurses and the doctors present. I thought I would stand up here and let you people see if I'm as big a son of a bitch as some of you think I am. I assure you that I had no intention of being either harsh or cruel in my treatment of the soldier in question. My sole purpose was to try to restore in him some appreciation of his obligations as a man and as a soldier. And you know, I often think, can you imagine a German or Japanese general <laughs> going around addressing troops, apologizing for an incident like that? Unbelievable. But he did. I thought that uh, Dad's job was in, in danger for uh, supporting Patton to the extent that he did. Yes. It was very, if you look back to the papers, it was very, very nasty. The whole thing. And uh, I think there were some people who felt that it reflected on my dad's judgment for keeping this ogre aboard. What people, when they made such a scene about that was, they didn't realize that he'd been out there fighting and sweating and bleeding, and he was just as tired as the soldiers were. And he said, I never should have laid a finger on an enlisted man, and I've apologized to everybody. It was my fault, and I shouldn't have done it. But they never let him forget it. We'll be back with the Year of the Generals in a moment. For General MacArthur, 1942 must have been pure frustration. Yes. First of all, he resented the decision made in Washington that the war was going to be won in Europe first. As far as he was concerned, that only meant that he wasn't going to get the resources in the Pacific he needed to win the war. But most of all, he resented the attitude of the Navy that the Philippines really weren't important, that they could be bypassed on the road to Japan. When he was forced to retreat from the Philippines, he proclaimed, I shall return, and by golly, he was going to return. MacArthur's back in Australia, chomping at the bit, wanting to advance back up to the Philippines, and he has nothing to advance with. And he demands more and more supplies from Washington, and, well, Washington doesn't have the supplies, so it was a contest of wills all the way, all the way through. MacArthur made great demands on what he needed to destroy the Japanese menace. He refused to recognize the German threat. He, he uh, uh, made quite plain his view that the Marshall strategy to fight the German war first and then the Japanese was the wrong one. I heard the general say one time, MacArthur's a great soldier, but he's got the worst case of localitis I've ever seen. <laughs> this amazing man, MacArthur, Probably one of his biggest flaws was the fact that he always felt that there were other lesser human beings who were constantly plotting to undermine him in some way or another. And he relegated Marshall to that group, Eisenhower to that group. Indeed, he relegated President Roosevelt to that group and was known to publicly castigate Marshall and Eisenhower. He became convinced that Marshall had Mr. Roosevelt's ear and that Marshall was just as smart as he was, almost as smart as he was. General Marshall really had a cool relay. He always referred to MacArthur, that fellow MacArthur. He spoke to most people, referred to most people by their last name, always. Uh, but he, when, it was Mar when it came around to MacArthur, he, would, he very often said, that fellow MacArthur, you could tell that MacArthur irritated him with these demands and these messages, and he would, he would end up a message every now and then to to deny this request is contrary to the fundamental principles of the art of war signed Douglas MacArthur and, and that sort of thing just bugged General Marshall because he he never said anything that pretentious in his life he just didn't think that way they were just diametrically opposed personalities and I think it's a good thing that they were separated by half the world he didn't get everything he wanted but he got a high percentage of things he wanted that I don't think a lesser man could ever have sold this idea of going back into the Philippines. But 
He had set up things so that his demand to go back to the Philippines almost had to be fulfilled. It was a matter of national honor. In two and a half years, MacArthur launched 87 amphibious landings. Every one of them succeeded. And for all his strutting and posing, MacArthur showed a prudent regard for his troops. Perhaps never before in the history of warfare did a general win so many battles with so little loss of his own men's blood. When MacArthur finally got some troops and he started from Australia and beachhead after beachhead after beachhead in New Guinea and up through the islands and into the Philippines, he lost one-third of the men that were lost at one battle at the Battle of Anzio in Italy. He lost less men than were lost in the Battle of the Battle of the Bulge. Of course, a great deal of the strategy had to do not with fighting the Japanese directly, but isolating them, island hopping, and leaving the troops to wither on the vine. He saw that if you could cut off this, the, the communications and lines of supply didn't matter if they were behind you um, because they were immobilized and defeated anyhow. One time a news correspondent asked him, he says, how do you make these decisions? He says, do you remember Wee Willie Keeler? He was a ball player that played around 1908 and he was one of the best hitters in the major leagues then. And one sportscaster asked him, how do you get so many hits? And Wee Willie Keeler says, I hit them where they ain't. And he says, that's exactly what I did. That really comes to the nub of what military art versus military science, military art is all about. You're trying to accomplish your mission, but you're trying to do it with a minimum loss of human life. And MacArthur was a wizard at that. I made all his landings with him. He spent a large part of his waking time wondering how he could save almost individual soldiers' lives. And God Almighty, the times he was ahead of them, the times we were between them and the enemy, the times we were behind the enemy lines, uh, made me feel that he, he once said, you know, I think we've had more, we've taken more risk than the average soldier has in this campaign, and I know damn well we had. The Japanese had all of these kamikazes who would load their plane completely with explosives and then act as a bomb themselves. So this one was coming in at us. They were shooting at him. Then they got one of his wings. Finally, he plunged into the ocean. Oh, God, if that had hit something like a ship, it would have been terrific. Well, I went to talk to the general about this. Our ship was just shaking because all our ac -ac guns were going and everything. And uh, I went up to the bridge. He wasn't there. And did he know where he went? No. So I went down. I went to his cabin. And there he was on his bed like this. I said, good God, he's died. So then I watched and I saw he was breathing. And so I went forward and took his pulse. And that woke him up. He said, what's the matter, Doc? He said, I just want to be sure that you're alive. And I said, what happened? He said, well, I saw all the, all the shooting. And I knew there was nothing I could do about anything. So I came down, took a nap. And his pulse was 70. And his breathing was normal. He was taking a nap. Imagine that. Well, I think that's an indication of whether he has courage or not. And finally, on October 20th, 1944, arrived the great emotional moment of Douglas MacArthur's life. 953 days after he left the Philippines by the back door, Douglas MacArthur came striding back in the front, as he said he would. People of the Philippines, I have returned. By the grace of Almighty God, our forces stand again on Philippine soil. The hour of your redemption is here. All of a sudden, 
two aircraft come out of the blue from nowhere. As they zoomed by, we saw those stars out there, the American star. You never saw so many happy guys cry. <laughs> you never saw that. Crying and laughing and crying and laughing. They're here. Flares were lighting the sky, and we could hear the gunfire from the courtyards. And somebody said, it's a tank. It's an American tank. So I came up slowly and stopped right in front of the, of the doors, and um, somebody hollered, any Americans in there? And we said, yes, yes. So then we were free. And here was General MacArthur and his aides and a lot of people following him. And I heard his aides say to him, here's another of your Cregador nurses on your right, General. So he stopped and shook hands and said he was happy to see me. And then I noticed he was a five-star general. He had been made a five-star general during the war. We'll be back with the Year of the Generals in a moment. At first, of course, my father as a soldier believed that it is necessary to do everything to win the war. And then my father found out that the war was lost from the very beginning and that it was better for the whole world and for Germany that it was lost. In the fall of 1944, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel was implicated in a plot to kill Adolf Hitler. He was secretly given the choice of standing trial or drinking poison. He poisoned himself and was buried in an elaborate state funeral. Montgomery never failed. Montgomery began with victory and he went on with victory. He was a consistently victorious general. Bernard Montgomery managed to patch up his differences with Ike, but he remained a prickly character until the day he died. A grateful Briton made him Field Marshal Montgomery, Viscount of Alamein. Another war has ended, and with it my usefulness to my country. Peace is going to be a hell of a letdown. Having helped conquer Germany, George Patton went out for a pheasant hunt one day near Mannheim. His chauffeured limousine hit an army truck. Patton was critically injured, and two weeks later, he died. He came home for one short visit, then he went back and got killed. He always told us in the time we were growing up that he would die in a foreign land, in a, in a war, and that he wanted to be buried where he died because Napoleon said that the boundaries of an empire are the graves of her soldiers. So we buried him in Luxembourg. George Marshall moved from the Pentagon to become Secretary of State and author of the Marshall Plan for rebuilding Europe. In 1953, he became the only professional soldier ever to win the Nobel Prize for Peace. General Marshall became the greatest statesman soldier of this century. He was a peace general if there ever was one. He detested war and everything about it, and uh, everything that he did was designed to prevent war ever occurring again. He was as big a hero as any we've ever had, and, and because he was not flamboyant, people just don't realize how much he did for the country. After the war, Douglas MacArthur ruled Japan as military governor. He wrote their constitution, still used today. But finally, he lashed out at his superiors once too often. During the Korean War, he was sacked by President Harry Truman, and he retired from the army. 
I know war as few other men now living know it. And nothing to me is more revolting. The world has turned over many times. Since I took the oath on the plane at West Point, and the hopes and dreams have long since vanished. I now close my military career and just fade away. And Ike? Well, you know about Ike. None of us could be sure of how that war was going to come out. The thing that sustained us all was leadership. Leaders sometimes have to be optimistic when the facts don't call for it. And he was. Dwight D. Eisenhower emerged as one of the most popular Americans of the century. In 1952, he was elected to the first of two terms as President of the United States. Charles, these young men and women marching behind us are from my old cadet company, Company A-1. You know, today, nobody in this country knows their names. As a matter of fact, during peacetime, historians lament the lack of great leaders in our military. They say, where have all the leaders gone? Yet when their country needs them, great leaders emerge. That's exactly what happened to these extraordinary men that we've talked about today. Who knows? Maybe someday in the future, some of these young men and women will be wearing stars and leading their country. Let's hope it's not another year like 1942. Well, the whole world will say amen to that, General. Good night. Good night, Charles. Their specialty, solving crimes of passion. Silk stockings, later tonight on Crime Time After Prime Time. It's too hot to sleep. Thanks for making CBS America's most watched network. Now get ready for your local news. I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. To order a video cassette collector's edition of The Year of the Generals, call 1 800 733 8500. That's 1 800 733 8500. Call now.